Oh my god, wait, I just realized, I just realized. Oh my god, he knows. <laughs> that is so cruel. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi. I'm Mia Tiffany, and welcome to the Tiffany Club, where we are rediscovering some of the greatest classic films throughout history. Today, we are continuing our journey with the great Alfred Hitchcock by exploring his film, Rope. Now, before we jump in, I would like to shout out my Golden Oscar patrons. Thank you all so much for your continuous support of the channel. And if you're interested in exclusive VIP content, then the link is in the description box below. If you're not quite interested in becoming a VIP member, however, you still want to support the channel, why not give a super thanks? Giving a super thanks works like this. Click on the heart icon titled thanks, which is located right above the subscribe button. Choose the amount you would like to donate for a one-time donation. Add your debit, credit, or PayPal information, and then hit buy. And it really helps to improve the channel. So for those of you who have given a super thanks, I really truly want to thank you so very much. Also, before we jump in, I wanted to let everyone know that we have got a new microphone, which you can see right here in the shot. <laughs> um, hopefully it's not too distracting. Thank you to everyone who has supported the channel, including my patrons and those who give super thanks. You guys actually helped buy this microphone. So thank you so, so much. Now we have audio that's a little bit better than what we had before, so thank you. So Rope was released in 1948, directed by Sir Alfred Hitchcock, starring James Stewart, Farley Granger and John Dahl with other notable performances by Edith Evanson and Douglas Dick. All right, on to a quick synopsis of the film. It says two wealthy young men try to commit the perfect crime. Ooh, this sounds fun. All of Alfred Hitchcock's films sound really intriguing. And so I'm super excited to see what he does with this film. So at this point, we are going to get onto some historical background. For those of you who want to jump right onto the film reaction, go for it. But for those of you who want to stay, we're going to get right into it. Okay, so Rope was Hitchcock's first film after his contract ended with David O. Selznick, which meant that he finally had more creative freedom without being under the watchful eye of Selznick, because apparently Selznick was kind of like a micromanager and it really hindered a lot of Hitchcock's creativity. So after Hitchcock's contract ended with David O. Selznick, he partnered with Sidney Bernstein to create their own production company called the Transatlantic Pictures Corporation. Now under their new production company, Hitchcock and Bernstein started looking for their next big project. After a few failed plans, Hitchcock remembered a play that he saw in 1929, which happened to be Patrick Hamilton's play, Rope. He and Bernstein decided that they wanted to make Rope into a picture. So the duo called on Hume Cronin and Arthur Lawrence to adapt a screenplay for them. On to some interesting facts. So Patrick Hamilton, the author of the play Rope in 1929, modeled his play after the real life story of the notorious Leopold and Loeb murder case. So due to the case's graphic nature and due to Loeb and Leopold's lack of remorse for killing 14-year-old Bobby Franks, this crime was deemed the crime of the century. With that being said, this is my first time watching Rope and I'm very excited to dive in. But before we do, y'all know the deal. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification to stay in the loop. All right, everyone, it is time. Get comfy, get some snacks and some drinks and let us get into Rope. Jesus is a Warner Bros. YouTube does not like Warner Bros. Or it's like super, super sensitive to copyright. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. I am flabbergasted. They already, it, we're two minutes in, they already killed someone. What? Don't. Let's stay this way for a minute. One thing that I already like is the fact that there's no background noise in this scene. It's like silence. It really does add to that, uh, the intensity of what just happened. It's the darkness that's got you down. Nobody ever feels really safe in the dark. Nobody who's ever a child, that is. Yeah, never mind the fact that you just killed someone. It's the darkness that's got you down. 
Not the fact that you just murdered someone. All right now, Philip. Yes. Good. You, you better put those away. Put them in my checkbook drawer behind that metal box. He is like so cold. You just—he just killed a man, and he's totally unfazed by it. Well, the Davids of this world merely occupy space, which is why he was the perfect victim for the perfect murder. This reminds me of American Psycho, okay? Because, like, the coldness of this one guy in the blue suit, whose name I still don't know, his coldness is, like, and then the fact that he's like, kind of dressed like a like a businessman reminds me of American Psycho. We've killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. We're alive. Truly and wonderfully alive. Wow, that is a really twisted way of thinking. Wow, he is so cold. You're not frightened anymore, are you, Philip? No. You just astound me to david of course i do like though that they have um brandon here who's more of like the the sinister cold what you would expect a killer to be and then philip has more of the emotions in this i do like that character dichotomy brandon you don't think the party's a mistake do you no the party's the inspired finishing touch to our work not having it would be like uh painting the picture and not hanging it and also the camera work in this already I'm feeling it. I I love it already. The Kentleys couldn't be duller if they tried. After all, they they are David's mother and father. Oh. That doesn't make them any easier. To that is so cruel. He's literally inviting David's parents. The man who they murdered's parents. Like that that's cold, bro. Take the other one. What for? He's going to put the candles over the dead body. What the body. devil are you doing? Brandon, you're going too far. Why? What do you mean? As if to sh like as if to show it off. My gosh. I mean, from a killer standpoint, it's it's brilliant. No, it's not. I'm not adding that in. That's terrible. Brandon, we've got to have an excuse for the others. We have a very simple excuse right here. After all, oh, Mr. Kentley's coming mainly to look at these books. I de by the way, definitely notice that he showed the rope in that in that scene. So far, I really think that this is a brilliant idea to do this in a in a one shot type way. Very interesting. Brandon. Brandon. What is it? Go on, yank it out. I can't. Man, he is just losing it. Well, at least one of them is slightly human. I won't let either of us do... What, may I ask, is happening to my table? Uh, we're just moving the things in here. He's literally holding the murder weapon in his hand. I just noticed that. Oh, my God. Those candlesticks, they don't belong there at all. What's to be done with the books? Oh, we'll lay them out on the dining room table. I was sure she'd notice. Notice what? The rope, of course belongs in the kitchen drawer. He's just twirling it like he didn't just use it to kill someone, you know? Oh, they're here. Let's hope it's a success. Now the fun begins. How are you, Grandpa? Fine. Uh, just put your head This in. film, yeah. I just feel, is so artistic. He's using the, the dolly to really, like, allow the audience to still be in the action with the characters. And also, his cinematography is some of my favorite cinematography in film. Hello, Kenneth. Good to see you. You too. It isn't someone's birthday, is it? It's uh, really almost the opposite. <laughs> the opposite? Most also, decadent. I feel like for these actors in this movie, I absolutely applaud them for being able to be like on point when the camera's there with their line ready. Because, you know, if not, then the whole thing is <laughs> messed up because essentially this has been one single shot. David going to be here? Of course. <laughs> Just not in the way you think. Who else is coming? Janet Walker. Janet. Your chances with the young lady are much better than you think. Like, it's not just a party. It's a party to celebrate the fact that they committed the perfect crime. And then to just stick the needle in further, right? Or the, the knife in further. They invite all of these people that were so near and dear to David. Like, that is so cold. Hello, Ken. Hello, Jan. Why did you invite Kenneth? We called it quits ages ago, and I'm practically engaged to his best friend. David? Yes, David. It's just... He's just enjoying this. You can see it on his face. I hear Rupert's coming. Well, he was invited, but you never know with Rupert. He thinks murder is a, a privilege for the few. I wonder if he used the Technicolor not to accentuate the colors, but more so to tell the story, you know? Or he just wanted to be super artistic. David! Oh, no, no uh, this is... Uh, you've made a mistake. Th this is Kenneth Lawrence. Oh, my God! so scared he broke the cup in his hand oh you've hurt your hand oh, it's nothing just a little cut what happened nothing the glass was cracked and it broke that's all brandon's like 
<laughs> I feel like Philip is going to be the one to kind of like give it up. Is David here? Yes, he is. I expected him to come with you. He called and said that he'd meet us here. Oh, he kind of had a little bit of like nervousness in his eyes. Just slightly, though. May I see your hand? Good finger. These hands will bring you great fame. That is so deep if you think about it, because, like, she said fame, right? But she didn't say what type of fame. It could be, like, infamous, you know? I don't know. That is That was really deep, though, the, the way that she said that. David wasn't there? No, he'll probably be here in a minute, though. <laughs> There's James Stewart? I was waiting for him to pop in. I just, you know... I was just sitting here waiting patiently. May I present Mr. Rupert Cadell, the housemaster at Somerville? I used to be. Then you must have taught my son, David. You always did stutter when you were excited. Yeah, that's the first time we see Brandon kind of showing a little bit of, like, nerves. A little nervous. Which makes me feel like just the way that Brandon is kind of acting around him, like something is going to happen. I just feel it. I hope David gets here soon. Yes, where is David? I haven't the faintest idea. Brandon, exactly what is this? Uh, Cassone, I got in Italy. No, no, I mean, why are we eating off it? You can tell that there's a very insightful aspect to his character. Like, he, he notices something is off. It, it's like, maybe it's not apparent to him yet, but he definitely notices something is off. White or dark? I don't eat it. Well, as I remember, Philip, you have a very funny reason. That's a lie! Philip! Just I because never... I strangled a chicken and you know it. I like how they how he kept the camera on James Stewart because it kind of almost seems like he realized something in that outburst. I don't know. Well, now, you don't really approve of murder, Rupert. Think of the problems it would solve. A flick of the knife and here's your table. <laughs> he talks so nonchalantly about murdering people and how he's like, I don't know, that's just, it's very interesting. Murder should be an art. And as such, the privilege of committing it should be reserved for those superior individuals. Oh, so it's almost like it's almost like his philosophy of murder kind of influenced the mindset, at least of Brandon, you know? Because Brandon seems to be eating this up. And the victims, inferior beings whose lives are unimportant anyway. Personally, I would prefer to have strangulation day. He's <laughs> literally describing the purge. <laughs> Like one day where everyone just kills each other for 12 hours straight or all crime is legal. And I don't know if he's talking about that in theory or if he truly believes that, but clearly it had an impact on his students. Who is to decide that a human being is inferior and is therefore a suitable victim for murder? Those men of such intellectual and cultural superiority that they're above the traditional moral concepts. It's a really interesting kind of thought process as to think that murder should be held for like the most superior, but every every human is flawed in some way. So how would you assess who is the most worthy? Where did you put those books you set out for Mr. Kentley? I'd very much like to see them myself, I may. Of course, they're in the dining room. Again, I'm afraid I let myself get carried away. Just really, whenever you see a really horrific crime, you think to yourself, what was, what were they thinking? Like, what was going through their mind? And so to kind of see the mentality kind of played out in this in this film, is very interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting dialogue that we have here. Brandon. Yes? You were really pushing your point rather hard. You aren't planning to do away with a few inferiors by any chance. Yeah, he already did. <laughs> he already tested the theory. I don't believe David's coming. I think you deliberately arranged it so that he wouldn't come. I might have known you couldn't just give a party. Again, love how no. Rupert is right there in the shot. Again, it kind of tells us like there's going to be some sort of conflict between them. Like Rupert's going to figure it out or something's going to happen. Mr. Brandon was in a maddest rush for me to clean up and get the table set. But then when I was whisking out to do the shopping, he suddenly told me to take the whole afternoon. I wonder why he decided to invite Rupert because in the beginning he did say something along the lines of the only person who would really suspect it would be Rupert. Clearly, Rupert's starting to realize that something's off. What's going on, Philip? Would you mind turning that off? I don't like to play with light in my eyes. No, he, you just don't want him to see your face, because he's literally wearing his emotions on his face. I get quite intrigued when people don't answer questions. and quite curious. I asked you what is going on here. What's it all about, Philip? Also interesting that the sirens begin to play right as... Rupert kind of starts questioning, like, what's really going on here? Because there's something fishy. Almost kind of convey, like, foreshadowing a little bit. I don't know. You want to know something? Come out with it. Otherwise... Oh, no. Temper, temper. 
No, don't stop. I'd like a drink. Oh, wait, I'll get it for you. I'll keep playing. What would you like, scotch? He is so on edge. But I mean, that's good, because we want him to kind of, you know, kind of figure it out, I guess. Where's David, Philip? I don't know. Brandon knows. Does he? Doesn't he? Not that I know. Oh, come now. I don't. Why don't you ask Brandon? Using the metronome during this sort of line of questioning, almost like an investigation of sorts, um, it kind of adds to that suspense. So it's very interesting, the more subtle things that, he, that Hitchcock here is employing to kind of heighten the suspense. That's the second time you haven't told me. Thanks. When was the first? When you said you'd never strangle a chicken. That metronome is getting... Is it called a metronome or is it a mono, mononome? Met, met, it's getting quicker. Which is, like, making me a little bit more anxious. I didn't think it was a suitable topic of conversation while we were eating. You could have said that. All right, I didn't. We're not eating now, Philip. What did you lie to me for? I get it now. The reason why he lied about strangling the chicken is because he is likening it to the fact that he strangled David. And then Rupert caught on to that and realized something's off. So, oh, this is getting sort of, this is getting interesting. Strangling I can't chicken. play with that thing. I want you to have them. Very much. It's extremely generous of you, Brandon. I don't know. Please, I know you're- He literally used the rope that he killed David with to bind the books together. Don't you want Mr. Cantley to have oh the books? Oh my god. No. I mean, I don't care if he has them. I just- What? what? I just think it's a clumsy way of tying them up, that's all. He's like, mm, are you sure about that? You're getting real worked up about that rope, sir. I don't know, Janet. I hope so. The David, I remember, was very polite as well as very punctual. Oh, the Such books. Such as the club or the Bradleys the are giving a party. The books went in the chest before he, they put David in the chest. And she's going to try and put it in the chest! Now, if we knew where he was this afternoon, what do you think, Brandon? I haven't the least idea where he was this afternoon. This is so Don't interesting that he decided to... we found out where he... It's, it's interesting how he decided to capture the housemaid kind of cleaning up the, the dinner scene instead of the, the full conversation on the side here that's happening. And it really does add, again, to the suspense of, like, they're going to start figuring it out. Things are going to start happening, you know? I don't know. It, it's just so cool. No, I wish I had been. <gasps> I don't suppose you were Oh my gosh, she's going to open it. It's just adding to this, like, she's going to figure it out. She's going to open the chest to put the books in there. And she's going to figure out that there's a dead body in there. Oh, my God. It's, like, totally suspenseful. Like, what's going to happen? I'll help you with that, Miss. Oh, thank oh you. Oh, my God. God. <gasps> That's all right, Mrs. Wilson. That was by far my favorite scene. Very suspenseful. Like, so, so brilliant. I'm quite sure he's all right. I, Randall, I think I'd better go home. My wife needs me. Your books. Oh, Oh, oh my yes. god, and he literally gave the murder weapon to the father. Like, how how cold is that? So, what a monster. Kenneth, why don't you come along with us? I'll get my hat. Oh, going with Janet? Yes, we're all going together. Oh, what did I predict? Hey guys, Editing Mia here. I just wanted really quickly to direct your attention to the little sign that's between Janet and Ken, the little lit sign. That is actually Alfred Hitchcock's cameo in this film. It is an outline of his very famous silhouette. And unfortunately, I had to look it up, so I kind of cheated. But I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> that's not yours. Oh. <gasps> it's David's. Oh, well, man. Oh yeah. my god, and he, oh my god, wait, I just realized, I just realized, he just, wait a second. <laughs> so now Rupert knows that David was there. So, okay, whoa, I didn't catch that fast enough. I'm sure he probably just feels so great about himself. Like, look at me, look at me. I just got away with the perfect crime. Good night, good night, it's been charming. Poor Philip. I mean, not poor Philip, he's a murderer too. What am I even saying? Well, come on, it's over, and it couldn't have gone more beautifully. I'm scared to death, Brandon. I think we're going to get caught. Oh, there's not a chance. In a way, I kind of feel bad for Philip because it's like, I mean, I don't feel bad that he committed murder, but I feel bad that he now has this remorse that he has to live with. Like, there was no reason for you to do it, bro. You didn't have to, but you did. Brandon, who's that? i the garage, man, with my car keys. Answer it. Brandon, it's Rupert. What? You've got to pull yourself together. Do you? Brandon, no, Brandon. No, look. <laughs> The proximity, their proximity in this film was very, there were moments where they were very close and there, the eye contact that they were using hinted at them being lovers. It was a very brilliant way to convey that without having the Hayes office like breathing down his neck, you know? I'm not going to get caught because of you 
or anyone else. No one is going to get in my way now. Very interesting how he always show Brandon always shows emotion or like nerves whenever he's talking about Rupert or whenever Rupert is like near. Very interesting. It's oh my God, loaded. it's a gun. Is it? It is loaded. <gasps> I knew you were leaving tonight, and I didn't want to be left without my case. I love Rupert so much. And it's not even because he's James Stewart. It's because of his character. I love it. Not perhaps. Any idea where you uh, left the case? No, no, not at all. I suppose a psychoanalyst would say that I didn't really forget it at all. Oh my God, he knows. <laughs> I was just going to open the chest for Mrs. Wilson when you open came the chest. over. Yes, he's like, wait a second, what? Here it is, right where I left it. Gentlemen, I beg your pardon. I'm very sorry. He knows it wasn't there because because Brandon was Brandon literally put the books on the chest. Like, he of course he knows the cigarette case wasn't there, which means that Brandon knows that Rupert is on to him. You are driving up to Connecticut tonight, aren't you? Uh, yes, uh, but we're all packed. All except one guest who must be gotten rid of. Well, I'll be off. At some point, like, Rupert has to leave, or else they're going to know that he knows, and then his life is going to be in danger. So I wonder what his intentions are. Like, what is he, what is he planning to do? Where is he? What's your theory? Like some small talk to put him at his ease, and then he'd sit down. My God, he's doing the exact same thing that he did in Rebecca. That is so cool that we get to see that again in this film. Oh my gosh. As I recall, David was quite strong. He'd have to be knocked out. So I'd move quietly around behind the chair and hit him on the head with something. He's like literally describing what could have happened. I love this sequence so much. Well, let me see. Well, I think I'd get Philip to help me carry him out of the room down the back stairs, and the two of us would put him into the car. It's just all the things that Hitchcock is employing in this film from a technical aspect is so intriguing. Oh my God, I love what he has done with this. Uh, you, you said yourself that if anything did happen, it must have happened in broad daylight. Well, that means I'd have to find some place to hide the body until dark. Why is, he, why is Brandon, like, giving Rupert hints or, like, letting him go through what might have actually happened. I feel like he wants to be found out. Unless you came back to find something besides your cigarette case. You mean, for example, to find if you really got rid of David? Yes. Like, you're literally... He's literally giving him... He wants to be found out. That's a gun, isn't it? Yes, it is. Sure is. <laughs> I have to take it up to the country. There have been several burglaries, and mothers have been on edge. I'm pleasantly surprised at the character of Rupert because I had this idea that he was going to be a very different type of character. And I'm really surprised and I really like what his character is, you know? <gasps> How does he have the rope? Lovely night. Oh my God, what is he going to do with that? Always is. You made me do it and I hate you. I hate both of us. I... <gasps> He's like, I know. Don't even, don't even try to hide with your lies. I knew he was doing it for like a... Like to show off. Got to look inside that chest. Yes, All right. look inside the chest. Go ahead and look. <laughs> it's the secrets. The secrets are revealed. Right and wrong. Don't hold for the intellectually superior. That's all we've done. That's all Philip and I have done. He and I have lived what you and I have talked. He's like, you are crazy. That was in theory. It was talking conversation tonight you've made me ashamed of every concept i ever had by what right do you dare say that there's a superior few to which you belong that's exactly what i was talking about in the beginning there is no way that one human being could be superior to another because we're all so terribly flawed and that can be applied to so many different social situations that you can think of really really like in that dialogue did you think you were God, Brandon, when you choked the life out of him? It's not what I'm going to do, Brandon. It's what society's going to do. You're going to die, Brandon, both of you. They got the right one to do this. Oh, my God. He killed that monologue. I felt every single second of it. 15 million points to James Stewart. What a way to alert the authorities. Because he could have just called the cops, but no, he's like, we got to go bigger than that. I love how the the conversation, the cacophony of voices in the background start to rise. 
Like a crowd is forming. Like people are going to know about what you did in this apartment complex, or this apartment building. They're coming. They're coming. There are the sirens again! Full circle! I knew it was foreshadowing. Oh. And then also to rise the noises or the sound also kind of goes back to the metronome scene. What a fantastic film. That was fantastic. From a technical aspect, this film was stunning. I mean, the fact that he decided to shoot it in a single shot really kept the audience involved in the story. Um, the fact that we had l minimal cut to scenes, the fact that we were able to kind of follow the characters as they were unraveling really made you feel like you were a part of this story. The end really just encapsulates the whole film. So yeah, for me this time, it was an eight of 10. Thank you guys so much for watching it with me. All right, everyone, that does it for this video. As always, if you liked it as much as I did, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification to stay in the loop. If you want to see this film's full-length reaction, it is up exclusively on Patreon, available to our Golden Oscar patrons. In the next video, we are continuing with Alfred Hitchcock, and I should tell you guys, we are going to be extending the Hitchcock month just because of all of the technical difficulties from this month, so it is going to be extended into October. So with that being said, we are continuing our Hitchcock series with his film Vertigo. Now I'm very excited to watch Vertigo because a lot of you has, have said that this is one of his quintessential essential films so I'm super excited to check it out if you haven't seen vertigo then I highly encourage you to watch it um, either in its entirety or just check a quick synopsis of it online then come back with all of your movie facts and your movie insights and we are going to talk about it in the comment box below if you have any recommendations for any classic Hollywood films we do have a recommendation form go ahead and check that out it is in the description box below thank you all so so much this has been a pleasure as always everyone please stay safe and healthy out there and I will see all of you in the next video bye everybody club where we are rediscovering some of the crap I was feeling it and I forgot to turn off my phone <laughs> Directed by Sir Alfred, to, uh, 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 <laughs> starring. <laughs> totally messed up. Try to commit the perfect murder. Why did I say commit? <laughs> I just totally said commit. And so Hitchcock was really happy that he finally had a chance to kind of. Ah, uh, again! Hitchcock and Bernstein began looking for new project. Blah 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 blah. blah, blah. Hitchcock and Bernstein. <laughs> Hitchcock. <laughs> Why can't I say it? This crime was considered the... Why am I talking like a robot? <laughs> Guess we'll see it in the playback. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't look like terrible. Bye.